2 Corinthians 11. Know your enemy. Know who Satan is. This guy, I think he gets who Satan is because he actually worships Satan. This is the story that I told you about uh, about a month ago. Uh, this, yeah, about a month ago, 1st of September is when this came out, and I couldn't show you the graphics part of it. But this is the guy, him and his wife, they worship Satan. Inside America's devil-worshiping church where Satan lovers burn Bibles. Yeah, that's evil. That's just evil, evil stuff. And they do rituals, and it's bad. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, to them it's a form of deliberate blasphemy. And um, now, can somebody who worships Satan, can they actually be converted? I believe so. Um, however... There are a couple of names that I could give this morning of people who at one time were very, very deep into Satanism. And uh, one of them's dead right now. The other one is still alive. But what he supposedly got saved, but what he's gotten into now is about as bad as Satanism. And it's... It's basically, they went from one form of not believing the Bible to another form of not believing the Bible, but in that form, they call themselves Christian. This is Adam Daniels. He's the high priest of the church of Ahriman. It's based in Oklahoma City. And um, I'm looking at this picture here of him, and let me... I can actually, I got a pen, I can actually draw what I'm pointing out to you this morning. When I saw this this morning, that's what really bothered me. It's an upside down cross. The pentagram, of course, you know, that's Isaiah chapter 14 tells you what the pentagram is all about. But the upside down cross is another form of blasphemy. The cross means to try to save people. And it means to liberate them from the bondage of guys like this. Now, this guy claims that um, <clears throat> he knew about Christianity. And there was a time in his life where he was a convenience store clerk and was being robbed. And he had to kill the guy that was robbing the store. Now, he claims that he, it bothered him, and he went into looking for help from religions to help him cope with the fact that he had to kill this guy. His claim is that the Christians were telling him that he ought to feel guilty for killing this guy. He obviously didn't go to the right Christians because this man was defending his life and I couldn't say that it wouldn't bother me if I took somebody's life, even defending my own or defending somebody else. Uh, it would bother me, but at least I know scripturally that it would have been justified. Whoever he talked to, and he's probably, and this may be just an excuse that he's coming up with. But he says that when he got into Satanism, Satanism freed him from the guilt. Because Satanism teaches him, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. In other words, do whatever you want. Do whatever pleases you. Do whatever extends your life. Do whatever makes you happy, even if it makes other people sad or angry, or hurt, or whatever, you are, when you are worshiping Satan, you're worshiping self. You become your own God. You believe the lie 
that Satan told Eve in Genesis 3. In other words, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And, I mean, what offends me about his whole existence is his upside-down cross. He does not understand the cross. He does not understand what it stands for. He does not understand what it means. Christ died even for him. Even for him. Christ died to set him free. Christ died. It's actually the greatest form of love ever shown by anybody was Christ's death on that cross because Christ was dying so that this man would not have to go to hell. Now, maybe his worship of Satan has skewed his idea of what hell is like. But I assure you that when he gets there, he will regret everything. Now, the reason why I bring this story up today, uh, here's what he said. Being a Satanist uh, in the Bible Belt can be restricting. It's hard to keep work. It's hard to even get work. Once people know, they treat you differently. I've lost contact with basically every member of my side of the family. Um... Part of the group's practice involves intentionally blaspheming. And Daniels, that's his name, says he has burned the holy books of all the world's major religions. I have ritualistically burned the Bible, the Koran, the Talmud, the Torah, the Buddhist Sutra, different Hindu sutras, you name it, I've burned it out of blasphemy. I'm not responsible for God, and no God is responsible for me. Through my words and my deeds, I am offending God, and that is my whole goal, to make his people miserable, to bring about apostates, and to bring about anguish. It's a stated belief system. Now, um, when it comes to offending God, offending me, um, I'll say this. I'm not afraid of this man's existence. Because it's people like him, seriously, that make people like us look good. But it's people, if I'm not, I'm not afraid of what everybody says about God, I do not feel like I have to defend God. Because God doesn't need anyone to defend him, he's God. He's God, he is Lord over everything, including this man's existence. And what I know from the Bible is, God uses people like him to deceive people who only want to be deceived. Those who actually want to know the truth and want to be made free, God knows who they are, and God makes them free. And so, his existence in the world... Um, I don't like it, but I don't think that I have to call Congress and have them pass laws to ban this man's existence. Let him say what he's going to say, and then let's view whose life turns out the best. Let's see who has regrets on his deathbed, okay, as far as that's concerned. Um... And here's why I brought this up. Revelation 13, let's turn there. And I'll just, we'll just kind of go through the scriptures. This part about Satan and his existence and what he is, uh, I think is probably uh, one of the most telling about his nature and his character. In Revelation 13, 4, the Bible says they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who's like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? Uh, the, probably the biggest thing that drives Satan, drives his ambition, drives what, his, what he's motivated to do, what he's trying to do, is that he desires... Uh, I think desire is probably a lame word for it. I think he demands worship. He commands 
that people everywhere must worship him. If there are two, if there are out of the two, between God and Satan, I can absolutely tell you that it is God who is the one who allows freedom of choice. God allows people to choose to worship Satan or to choose to follow Buddha or to choose to follow um, Allah or choose to follow any of the other gods that there are out there, God allows people to make that choice. God gives people freedom of choice, freedom of will. If they want to worship other gods, God allows them. Now, there's consequences for that, but God gives man freedom of choice. Out of the two, God and Satan, it is Satan who does not want people to have a choice. I mean, think about it. In countries all over the world, it is forbidden to preach the gospel. Think of uh, even European nations where Catholicism controls the laws of the land. Catholicism does not want the Protestant evangelicals the Protestant missionaries to go into those nations and try to evangelize Catholics. They do not want their people to have a choice between whether they want to worship and follow the Pope and fall before statues or believe the Bible. They do not want their people to have that other choice. In most Muslim nations, it is against the law, the, the state laws, to allow other people to preach another religion. They do not want people to have a choice. In most communist nations or socialist nations, they do not want their people to have the choice to follow uh, the Bible. They want them to follow the state. The state is their God. From the state, they're supposed to get everything. And to the state, they give their allegiance. Think of North Korea. North Korea does not want any other religious system in the world because Kim Jong, yeah, Kim Jong Un is not only the state leader, but he is the state god. They worship him as the god of North Korea and the god of the people of North Korea, and he is practically elevated to a godlike state. And they do they ban Bibles, do not want Bibles to be allowed in there. They're the ones who do not want people to have a choice. Liberals in this country say they're all about freedom and liberty and choice, except when it comes to the Bible. They do not want... Why, why are liberals the ones who they praise and honor every other religion in America except... Bible Christianity, they do not want Bible Christianity in our school systems, they don't want it in our courthouses, they don't want it in our legislative halls, they do not want it anywhere. They're the ones who want to ban choice, especially when it comes to choosing the Bible or not. God allows people to decide, I'm going to follow the Bible or I'm not going to follow the Bible. God is the one who allows them to do that. It's everybody else who wants to take away that choice. And so when it comes to the devil, he not only desires that people worship him, he demands it and does not allow anyone to worship anything except him. Romans chapter 1, verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. Um, I mentioned the pentagram. Turn to, uh, turn to Isaiah 14. You'll see inside of Satan's heart, Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. 
I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. He wants the stars of God, which are the angelic realm, he wants that they must follow him, that they must obey him and only him. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. He desires that the congregation follows what he says and only what he says. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So, uh, if you look in Ezekiel 28, turn to Ezekiel 28. Verse 2, here Satan is called the Prince of Tyrus. Now tonight, or this afternoon... I'm going to be teaching on devils and how they're referred to in the scriptures as princes or principalities. So tonight, I'm going to be teaching on principalities. It, I encourage you, strongly encourage you to be here, strongly encourage you to be watching. Um, it is going to, we're going to kind of go in deep in the scriptures, but... It's going to give us an understanding of why things happen the way they do. Why things happen in families. How many children in America are being raised in fatherless homes? Way too many. And I mean way too many. Or let me say it like this. How many children are being raised in homes where the natural father is not in the home where the children are being raised, okay? Whether it's a live-in boyfriend, no boyfriend, or a stepdad. There's a reason for that. There's a reason. Um, but anyway, Ezekiel 20, I, I, tonight I'm going to be teaching on principalities. And the prince of Tyrus is not just referring to this man who is king over Tyrus. It is a reference to an angel, an evil angel, a devil, who is a principality devil. In other words, they have been given authority over a certain group of people. Do you believe that there is a principality that has authority over America? Okay, I'm going to show you a picture of it tonight, okay, of what that principality looks like. Son of man, Ezekiel 28, verse 2, Son of man, send to the prince of Tyrus. Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. That is the devil saying, I am God. Capital G. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas yet thou art a man and not God though thou set thine heart as the heart of God if we look over in verse 15 thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee and the iniquity was his heart was lifted up it was pride by the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty, and thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, and I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee." And so we see that the devil, his sin was that his heart was lifted up because of his beauty, because of his illumination, which I think was connected to his wisdom, and his heart was lifted up, and he said within his heart, I will be God, I will sit in God's seat, and I will make everybody worship me, even though they think they're worshiping God. 
See, there's something, here's the big difference, or one of the big differences between God and Satan. God actually wants you to know who you're worshiping. All through the Old Testament, God said he's going to do things with Israel so that you may know that I am the Lord thy God, that you may know that you may know. It's all about knowing. When it's God, it's all about knowing that you have the right God. Remember, that's what we're preaching uh, last Sunday morning was Gideon wanted to know if he had the right God or not. He wanted to know. God wants you to know. The devil doesn't care if you know that you're serving Satan. He doesn't, in fact, his, his ways are so deceptive that he's actually better off with you thinking that you're worshiping God when you're actually worshiping him. He doesn't care. The devil doesn't, whether this guy that practices this Satanism religion, whether he's got all of his doctrine right about Satan or not, the devil doesn't care. In fact, whatever lies this man believes, the devil is fine with that. that if, if this man's going to go to hell and he knows it, the devil then doesn't care whether or not this man's got his doctrine right on hell or not. Um, I think back to an interview. I heard the, um, the band members of ACDC came to St. Louis back in the 80s and they did an interview with KC95 and they were talking about the song Highway to Hell and they said they wrote it because they said it to us, it's boring in heaven. We want to go to hell. So they have another song called Hell Ain't No Bad Place to Be. The devil doesn't care that they've got their ideas about hell wrong. He doesn't, he doesn't care that they believe the right thing or not. In fact, he would rather them believe lies. And most people do. So, he, he wants to be worshipped. So, uh, turn to 2 Thessalonians 2. In the Old Testament, we see that it's the prince of Tyrus... In the New Testament, we find out that it is the man of sin. And think of it like this. God the Father has delivered all things to His Son, Jesus. He's giving Him His power. He's giving Him um, His kingdom. He's giving Him His creation. He's going to give Him heaven. And he's going to let Christ rule it. Satan then is going to deliver his kingdom. His, the Bible says his power, his seat, and great authority. He's delivering that to the beast, the man of sin, the son of perdition. So, 2 Thessalonians 2, this is, uh, let me, let's read down to it. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. See, there's the Bible telling you, not to be deceived. Satan tells you, I don't care if you're deceived or not. In fact, I'm better off if you're deceived. I'm better off if you believe lies. I don't care. So let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Where did he get that idea from? He got it from Satan. So that, or that is worship, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And so he wants, he demands to be worshipped. And even if you think that you're worshipping his enemy, God, he's perfectly fine with that. As long as you're worshipping him, even if you think you're worshiping Jesus or you're worshiping God, he's fine with that. So he desires to be worshipped, but in that, he wants to be worshipped and be cloaked in that worship. Doesn't want you to find out that he's the one that you're actually worshiping. Whereas God says, I want you to know that it's me. Everybody... 
uh, what is it that we know is going to happen? Every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord. Satan makes no such requirements. He doesn't care if you say the name Jesus, but in fact you have the wrong Jesus. Paul said another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. And so we know that that spirit, that gospel, and that name Jesus is not God's spirit, not God's son, not God's gospel. The devil would rather have it that way as long as he gets the worship. Uh, we have in history people that have worshipped the serpent or the serpent god. The Egyptian serpent god, Apep. Notice the Pharaoh on his forehead has a serpent coming out of his forehead or a serpent over his forehead as a mark of his forehead the forehead the frontal lobe this part of your brain is where you make all your moral decisions it's where right and wrong come in so think about it when the devil has you blinded you do not make the right choices concerning right and wrong it's like when you're drunk when you're drunk you do not make very good morality choices amen okay when you're good and put out through alcohol or drugs or whatever for some reason that dulls your ability to make those moral right and wrong you don't see everything as right and wrong you make choices based upon what you want what you desire what you crave what you lust after even if it's wrong and your frontal lobe right here your, where your forehead is is the part of your brain that makes that choice so when you're drunk it clouds that and you don't make right choices so consider where the mark of the beast goes right in the forehead it goes in the forehead Okay, probably could very well be a, just a, a blast upon people's brains, this part of the brain, where they still walk and they still talk and they still chew gum, but they do not know the difference between right and wrong. Think of why um, God did not want the priest, the Levite priest, why did God not want them to drink strong drink or wine? It's because... When they went in to do the temple service that they would not be able to put difference between clean and unclean between a sacrifice that was spotted and unspotted they don't know the difference between night and day right and wrong clean and unclean holy and unholy godly and profane they do not know the difference and you have scores of people scores Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in America claiming to be Christians, but they do not know the difference between holy and unholy, between clean and unclean, between godly and profane. They live profane lives, but they think that they're God's people. They think they're holy, and they're not. Something's wrong with them. But anyway, back to Pharaoh. He's got this thing coming out of his head it's the serpent he is worshiping the serpent and the serpent then guides his thoughts um in exodus chapter 7 turn now i love this story i love this story see pharaoh knew about serpents pharaoh's men his magicians his sorcerers knew about serpents and they knew how to make them they're the easiest things in the world to make out of play-doh right Just, you're done anybody can make snakes pharaoh's men make snakes but they made them with their incantations exodus chapter 7 verse 8 and the lord spake unto moses and unto aaron saying 
when Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you. Then thou shalt say unto Aaron, Take thy rod and cast it before Pharaoh, and it shall become a serpent. And Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh, and they did so as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, before his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers, now the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. For they cast down every man his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up, I love that phrase, swallowed up their rods, swallowed up their serpents, that is death being swallowed up in victory. It is the power of death being swallowed up by the power of the cross. Because on the cross, that's what Jesus was saying in John 3. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It's not that Jesus is the devil. It's that Jesus took on the form of his enemies when he was on the cross, nailing them to his cross, showing their defeat. So this is why Aaron's rod, which is Christ, swallowed up their rods. It shows the power of the cross that this guy hates, and so he wears it upside down. He doesn't understand the cross. And the power, of the, the power of the cross that this man hates, the reason why he hates it, maybe, I don't know, but the power of the cross has the ability to overcome all the power of the devil. Because the real power of the cross is love. And love and charity, the Bible says, charity covereth a multitude of sins. Love always conquers evil, does it not? Which is better for you, to hate your enemies or to love them? I didn't say which is easier, I said which is better, okay? And that's something the devil, the devil never understands true love anyway. All he understands is fake love and hate. That's all he understands. And when it comes to God and his religion, his religion is charity, his religion is love, it always is better and is always overpowers evil. So that means God's people should not be evil. Have charity. Love people. Love them first. Amen? If you have problems with that, then you have to ask God for help. And he'll help you. I promise you he will. He'll help you love people that you can't stand. He'll help you love them. Amen? God will help you love liberals. That's a tough one. Amen? God will help you love Diane Feinstein. Amen? That's a tough one right there. Father in heaven, we thank you for your religion. We thank you, Lord that we know who we're worshiping. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the God whose son is Jesus Christ. You're the God whose word we hold in our hands. And we've read it. We've seen it with our eyes. And we know what it says. So Father, I thank you, God, that you've taken every one of us from under the power of of Satan, the power of the serpent. And you've given to each one of us, Lord, a heart to love even our enemies, to love people, Lord, that we have a hard time liking, to love people of other religions, to love people of other ideologies. And Father, just help us, God, to overcome evil with what in essence is the truth of the cross and the power of the cross and that is love because that's what the cross represents it represents you god loving even the people who hate you loving them so much that you sent your son to die for people who've done nothing but curse you jesus died for this man who's burnt the Bible in order to blaspheme. 
Jesus died and loves the man who hates Christianity and he hates the cross. Father, teach us that kind of love. We don't come by it naturally. So teach us that kind of love and help us, dear God, to love people we don't love. Thank you, Lord, for taking us from the power of Satan. Father, help us to lead others, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.